Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, any questions on anything that we're, we've been going over where we are? Yes. Yes, who said yes? Esther. Esther. There's Esther. Okay. You moved. <laughs> I've got a couple on Ezekiel. Okay. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Cool. When he he's giving out the portions to the 12 tribes. Now, I know there's a lot of people in these tribes. What kind of area do you think they're talking about so I can get an idea? Well, the the allotment of the land to the tribes that Ezekiel talks about, it is, uh, it is all the way across from the Mediterranean to the... Uh, to east of the of the Jordan, uh, maybe even as far as the uh, Tigris, so that that's into modern day um, Iraq. Um, so it, it's that wide. So it I forget how long how how wide they are, but it's way wider or, or way wider than it is tall. So there's twelve strips of of land that go from from what is today Lebanon south to the northern end to just just north of uh, what is Egypt in the uh, it, it's referred to in the text as the the river of Egypt a lot of people think that that's the Nile but really that's a bad translation it's a brook of Egypt which is a one down in the southern Negev um, in what it, which is the natural boundary of the Sinai Okay. So all of all of modern Israel, plus a bunch to the north and a bunch to the east, will be d divided up in equal portions, and then with a with a great big section in the middle for the uh, the Levites and for the for the city of Jerusalem. Okay. Well, I know okay. it's a lot of people. And I just couldn't get it, the picture in my head as to how big these. Yeah, we don't we don't know how many people it will be. Because we don't know how many people will be alive at the time. Okay, so they're talking about the, the portions later. Right, in the, in the millennium. In the millennium. Okay, gotcha. Okay, yeah, okay, then that makes sense. Yeah, Ezekiel's a fun book, and I think when we get into it, it will have some fun in it. I had a lot of fun writing that stuff, and I tried to find good graphics to go along with it and I need an artist because what I see in my mind and what I've been able to find aren't the same. <laughs> yeah. Which shouldn't surprise anybody. Okay, and I just had one more. Well, then I don't even remember where I read it. It's still in Ezekiel. But he's talking about when they, they uh, if any of the masters give inheritance to their servants. Right. The servants can only keep it until the year of their, I, I, I said freedom, but I know that's not the word. Jubilee. Jubilee, Jubilee. okay. Well, what if they don't have it any longer? Why do they have to give it back if it's an inheritance? Well, and what if they don't have it any longer? Well, the, then whoever has it. The, the, the principle of Jubilee was every, every 50 years, right. uh, debts were forgiven. And so you 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 made the debt contingent on the year of jubilee. Every piece of property would go back to the original family or the original tribe, at least that had it at the time of the conquest. And it's really designed to not build a system that people depend a system of money that people depend on. It's designed to to cause an economy to depend on God. Okay. Okay. So, the, the the problem with the year of Jubilee is it wasn't it wasn't uh, um, followed most of the time. In other words, when the fiftieth year came around, they didn't give the property back. They didn't pay off their debts. They didn't uh, free slaves. Um, that was one of the complaints that God made against Israel, is that they didn't follow the Jubilee. 
Okay. Once in a while they did, and I, I don't know this, but I suspect they did when it was convenient for for a king to do that. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Okay. But it, it's really a, it's really an interesting thing. It's it's counterproductive to to our system of capitalism. Right. But it is it is perfectly in keeping with God's system of theocracy, where we're not depending on capitalism to to pay everybody. We're depending on God to care for everybody. Right. And so, if you had to give the property back, you uh, wouldn't become so dependent on it. Right, you wouldn't you wouldn't get that much. Right. Oh, okay. Of course. Even today, we're supposed to look at everything that we own is actually not ours, but God's. Right. Right. But in Israel, in Israel, they didn't actually get a title to the land. The God maintained title to the land. They got the use of the land ostensibly for 50 years or whatever is left till the next jubilee they just violated the the jubilee there is a great extra biblical book from the intertestamental period the between the old testament and the new testament the book of jubilees that provides us a lot of great detail into the historicity of all those things in the, in the nation of israel wow interesting when did we get started the jubilees when did they when they made conquest yeah when there there was there was a first day uh, or first year of conquest and then every 50 years after that it, and and israel followed the days and the sequence very well because of the feast days that they had to practice on the particular days but for the passover didn't get celebrated all the time and jubilee didn't get enacted all the time i i don't i i can't give a real figure but i think it's close to to 20 or 25 percent of the time that they actually did it record yeah any other questions or comments or where we're where we're at or where we're going or on anything else Oh, you don't want to know where I'm going. <laughs> well, yeah, I do. <laughs> I finished Daniel this morning. And every time I go through Daniel, I'm, I, I hear things or read things that I didn't see before. Mm -hmm. which, which means I'm a pretty bad reader because I've been through it how many times, you know. But I, I'm noticing things that I haven't seen before. Yeah. One of the, the one things in Daniel that, that kind of uh, interested me was when the king is uh, looking in the furnace and yeah. he sees four walking around. Yeah. <laughs> there's, a, yeah. There's, a, there's a debate. Was it Jesus or was it an, an, another angel? That could have been either one. That's right. Just so they were protected. They were protected, yep. They didn't, didn't even smell like smoke. I like it that the guys that threw him in died because of the heat. Yeah, but yet the king could go near it and look in. Yeah. Well, he didn't get near it. Well. <laughs> or or when uh, when Daniel's thrown into the lion's den and nothing happens to him and uh, the guys that uh, orchestrated for him to go to the lion's den get thrown in, they're eating up before they hit the ground. Yeah. I, I love the descriptions of that. Hey, Rich. Yeah, yeah. Come back to Jubilees. Time of the conquest, did you say that was 4,000, 5,000 years ago? Uh, Moses was 1800 something BC. So that would be only 3,800 years ago. Let me, let me look at my map and, or my charts and tell you right away. I've been done for you go to that extent. I was just. I just calculated that if, if it was 4,000 years ago, then there would have only have been 80 jubilee years right? Um, to this point. And then you're saying that they may have honored it 20 times. Right. I mean, you think, you think back so long, I mean, you 
think it should be hundreds of, of Jubilee years stuffed in there. Yeah, it's not that it's not that old. Well, the Earth isn't that old. That's correct. <laughs> but messes with our minds. Mm -hmm. Not with mine. Your mind's already messed. But Jubilees were given though when um, they're written down in Deuteronomy. So it was something like in the second giving of the law is when they were given uh, or instructions on it. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's given in the law. It's it's something they were required to do. They just chose not to do it. But they didn't follow most of the law. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to look at a general date. Because oh, I would I I. I, I only 80. I misspoke. And when, as soon as I said it, it didn't sound right. 1800s. 14. 1445 is uh, Moses. And so the, the, uh, um, the Exodus is in 1405. So it's even less. As soon as I said 1800, I, that didn't sound right to me. Yeah, the conservative uh, estimate is in 1405 was the exodus. No, I'm reading it wrong again. 1445 was the exodus. The conquest was 1405. Here, here I'll put it up here so you can read it. <laughs> it's 1422 so is about 3,600 years. So we're looking seventy-five or so. Yeah. Yeah. Thirty-five hundred works out to about seventy. So there's, uh, you know, they they didn't obey most of the rules, so it's not surprising that they didn't obey the jubilee because the 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 year of jubilee cost them. It cost them property, cost them money. And they didn't want to do that. What's that? They didn't want to give it back. No. I mean, it, the year Jubilee is counterproductive to a capitalist idea. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that's what God was intending. He didn't want them to depend on themselves. He wanted them to depend on him. And God didn't give them title to the land. That's that's one of the big arguments that the that the Palestinians claim is that they never owned the land and and that's technically true because God never gave up the title to the land. He just rented it to them for a period of time. And they had to do things, they had to pay the rent in a, in other words by by being obedient and they often didn't. By the way, we yesterday in the at the White House they signed uh, some peace treaties that nobody ever thought would happen. Um, the the last time an Arab state uh, signed a peace treaty with Israel, within a year their leader was dead when Anwar Sadat was killed, and then when uh, I guess that wasn't the last time, the time before last, and then uh, the last time was when Jordan did in 1994. So we have two nations now, more two more nations now that have signed a peace treaty with Israel, and it looks like there'll be several more. All the Sunni nations, which is which puts the Shiite nation of uh, of uh, uh, Iran all out there by itself, and it puts the Palestinians by themselves. So uh, exciting things are happening, perhaps. I'm just going to I'm going to throw this out there because I know it triggers some conspiracy theorists. Perhaps these peace treaties are the beginning of the treaties that will go into effect at the beginning of the of the tribulation that will be broken by uh, at the midway point. Maybe this is what sets those treaties up. Thank you, Hal Lindsay. No problem. <laughs> Just, uh, you know, when, when you look at, what, what? It ran through my mind, too, so. Yeah, when you, when you look at, at, the, at the current events in the light of what we know will happen, it seems like maybe things are being set up. 
But they've been saying that for a long, long, long time. And we don't know when God's coming. I'm not saying that the Lord's going to return tomorrow, next week, or Tuesday at 10 like, uh, like the disciples wanted. Uh, I just don't know. But maybe this is something to do with that. So with that in mind, let's go on to Revelation chapter 20. Chapter 19 closes with the Antichrist and the false prophet being taken alive in the battle of Armageddon while the armies of the world are wiped out. And John is giving a more detailed view of the Battle of Armageddon and its uh, results there at the end. And chapter 20 then begins to describe for us the reign of Jesus, the Millennial Kingdom. Chapter 20 is primarily about what happens or what goes on in the Millennial Kingdom. So. Huh? Chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And threw him into a pit and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a while. So we, we continue to assume that John is still on earth because he's seeing things come from heaven or from the sky. Okay, here, phone, you can just be quiet now. It's been beeping like crazy. So we assume John's still on earth as we haven't been given any indication that, he, that he's changed position. Dr. John Walford describes chapter 20 as one of the greatest chapters in all of the Bible. I don't know. I don't know that I'd go that far. It's, a, it's pretty cool. Some cool things happen. The Millennial Kingdom and all that. I don't know. I think the cross might be cooler. I think creation might be cooler. But I'm a creationist and Walford is, a, uh, is, a, is an es eschatological buff. So I guess we have our own positions. Um, John saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the keys to the bottomless pit, upon, along with a great chain. What we see here is John beginning a new section, and often as we go through Revelation, we have seen John begin a new section by talking about angels. He, see, he references an angel doing something, or he sees an angel do something, or, or an angel said something. So we kind of get the indication a new chapter or a new uh, section has begun. I should point out that some Revelation scholars believe that the angel in Revelation chapter 20 verse 1 is actually Jesus. Let me go back to the verse. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. So some scholars um, want to say that this is Jesus because of his power or judgment over um, Satan. We'll see over Satan in a, in a bit. Uh, based on the figure of bringing punishment to the Antichrist and to Satan. There's no other indication in the text that it would be Jesus. And I think John doesn't refer to Jesus as an angel ever. And so this would be odd. You know, Jesus is his friend. Remember, they were close. So I think John would refer to him as, as Jesus. But I don't know. So the bottomless pit is not the same thing as the, the lake of fire. That's correct. That's correct. The angel comes down with the keys to the bottomless pit in a great chain. He then seizes the dragon and the ancient serpent, Satan. The bottomless pit, also known as the abyss, uh, which is a transliterated... Greek transliterated Hebrew word, it's really in Hebrew, is the abyss um, or the deep. It's the home of the unclean spirits and demons. And we saw the bottomless pit back and the abyss back in chapter 9. 
the legion of demons that Jesus cast into the swine in uh, um, in Gehenna, uh, not Gehenna, in uh, starts with a G, ends in an A. I'll get it anyway. The this the the, the herd of pigs that Jesus uh, cast the uh, the legion of uh, uh, demons into. They were afraid of being sent to the abyss. The angel has a great chain in his hands. The angel seizes Satan and binds him for 1,000 years. Um, look at verse 2. He seized the dragon, the ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for 1,000 years. The verb is really the verb overcame. Um, has a sense much bigger than uh, seized or overcame in English. It means overpowered, subdued, and captured. Now, think about that. He didn't just lay hands on him. He completely immobilized him and depowered him. He prevented him from doing anything, is the picture. Think about what's not being said. But we should all understand. Satan was created as the greatest of angelic beings. Angels are, are created in a hierarchical order. Satan was at the top of the list. Yet this angel is assigned to bind Satan and take him to the bottomless pit. If there was an argument for this being Jesus, that would be it. But I don't think it is. I don't think it is Jesus. I think God gave extraordinary power to this angel for the job that he gave him. To overpower and to capture the greatest created being takes divine power. I think that's clear. If the angel is not Jesus, then he was empowered by God to imprison Satan for a thousand years. I want you to think about the magnitude of 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 that word overpower or seize the greatest created being who who has had extraordinary powers might even say supernatural powers since he fell just after creation and now god had assigned an angel or maybe jesus to subdue him and sequester him and depower him for a thousand years. That to me is a very dramatic statement that often gets, okay, he arrested Satan. It's way more than that. And we need to understand it that way. As I studied this, I pondered if this is an analogy or if John is actually seeing something that we will get to see or that will take place in the, uh, in the future. Um, to see a chain means the chain had some kind of physicality. To use a physical chain on a spirit, at least as we understand spirits, wouldn't work. Looking at the text from the perspective of an amillennialist, those that teach there is no millennium, who argue that uh, there, there won't be a millennium, they say that this text is symbolic and that Satan is spirit only and thereby, therefore couldn't be bound by a physical chain. So this caused me to think a little bit through the process that we use to, to uh, um, analyze scripture, the hermeneutical principles we use. We stress the use of literal, historical, grammatical understanding of the words presented to us in the text. When something is an obvious analogy, we take it as an analogy. The problem is, as I look at this text, I don't see that, it, that it, it's an obvious analogy. And so I'm, I'm a little, I'm still a little confused, a little perplexed on this. Uh, and I'm not prepared to solve the riddle. I would like to say that spirit beings have some kind of physicality to them. Except God, 
because God's omnipresent. He can't have any physical physicality to him. But we know at times angels do. We know at times demons do. So has God sequestered them in a physical form so he can physically bind them and depower them? I don't know. Just something that makes me go, huh, I don't have an answer here. <laughs> and I don't like that. <laughs> the amillennialist says there is no 1,000 year kingdom. Now, understand the next section that I'm going to talk about here from the perspective of an amill... <coughs> Esther, don't scratch your, your computer like that. We hear that very loudly. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, really? Yeah, your microphone picks that up. There you go. Some other nervous tick, okay? <laughs> uh, the Amillennius says there's no 1,000 year kingdom. They also teach that the binding of Satan uh, talked about here occurred at Jesus' first coming. And, and Satan has rema remained in the abyss since then. So understand what I'm saying. The amillennialist that says there's no millennium teach that Satan has been bound since Jesus was here 2,000 years ago. And how do they explain all the trouble we've been going through and having? That's called S-I-N, sin. Which will be... Well, see, that's exactly what will be proven in the millennium because Satan will be bound for 1,000 years. And sin will still will still be there. So I, I I respect their principle here, but that's the only way they could they could put all of scripture together is to say that he's bound now all this time. Because it's very clear that Satan gets bound for a period of time. They just argue that that period of time is is uh, since Jesus was here the first time. But there's still gonna be sin. What's the purpose of shutting him away? Well, that's that's a great question. What is the purpose of shutting Satan away? And and I think I'll prove in a little bit. Even the demons will be shut away. What what could what would God prove by doing that? I'm going to turn. We can't, like, we can't say Satan made me do it. Yeah, it totally destroys the Flip Wilson excuse. Or oh, I'm sorry, the to be technical, the Flip Wilson defense. The devil made me do it. We won't be able to say that. Or I shouldn't say we. Natural born people that are living in the millennium won't be able to say that. Because the devil's not able to do it. That's why I spent so much time on overcame or um, seized. He will be totally depowered for a thousand years. He and his demons will be depowered. So it will just be us. Or not us. He can still do wrong things even when he's not out there influencing. Right. And I shouldn't say us. It won't be us because we'll be gone. Gone. Right. It'll be natural born people that live through the tribulation into the millennium or are born in the millennium. So they will still have a sin nature and they'll still be able to sin. And I suspect that toward the end of the millennium, sin will abound big time. And so, what does that then do for God's argument for his punishment of sinners? It removes... He gave them plenty of chances to not sin without the influence of the devil and they sinned anyway. Exactly. In other words, we can't say, we sinned because Satan made me do it. Or... Again, I said we. No, true. It's, it, it'll be true for us too, because Christians use that excuse all the time. For sure. But we we will be new glorified bodies. We won't be able to sin. But natural born people will be able to sin, and they won't have that as a defense. You won't be able to say the devil made me do it because he ain't making anybody do anything then. But it also shows clear through all all time that. We were just bad to begin with. We didn't have to have him to be to right. Be bad. Right. As soon as Adam sinned, everyone after him was born with a sin nature, and that sin nature leads us to sin, causes us to sin. Our own desires cause us to sin, not Satan. Yeah. 
Right. Mm. So you're saying when he's bound and tied up, that he won't actually be actively prowling around, to use a better word, to influence people? That's that's correct. On the shoulder and say, uh-huh. Yep. Yep, it, it, the, the good angel on the shoulder will be lonely because there'll be no bad angel on the other shoulder. Yeah. So he can't be out there trotting around and influencing people because he's bound. Right. It'll that just be the big sin nature that we have or we've had in the beginning. Right. From the beginning. Right. And that's why I spent so much time there on Overcame because it, it totally depowers him. He's locked up. He's, he's not able to run his criminal empire from prison. Okay. Okay, Rich. Yeah. Back to back to the um, all millennial belief. Uh huh. They say he's been bound already, and the millennium's only a thousand years. Are we not two thousand years since Jesus' birth? Well, the all millennialist doesn't interpret the millennium as a literal thousand years. And how do they get past that? Well, because they don't use a a historical grammatical uh, hermeneutic. Okay. Dispensationalists are primarily the only are primarily the only um, theologians that that use literal historical grammatical interpretation of scripture. So we're forced to 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 read what God said, and we're forced to understand it in that way. The amillennialist. And those that don't use a literal historical gra uh, grammatical, that use primarily an allegorical hermeneutic, are pretty much free to interpret scripture however they want. So, the 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 millennium, the thousand years, is a reference to a period of time, not specifically to a thousand years. They don't believe in dispensations like we do. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it's a poor way of understanding all of the text. If you study um, all millennialist approach to the text, they, 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 they allegorize much of it in order for it not to come back and bite them in the butt. To me, that would just be so confusing. It is. It is. Just... Uh, just read the Bible Answer Man sometime on uh, on eschatology, and and it's like my head hurts before I get through his title. It's it's just not consistent, and it can't be because everybody gets to allegorize it. So uh, they believe that Satan is uh, not able to affect the church during the period this uh, uh, this period of time. Can you imagine? Um, what the church, from their standpoint, what the church age would have been like if Satan was able to affect the church? Holy cow. Uh, I, I think scripture is really clear that Satan is alive and well on the planet Earth, to quote someone. And I think that he will be bound at the beginning of the millennium and he will remain bound for the thousand years until he's loosed again. There is no reason to allegorize these three verses. He's bound. Whether that's a spiritual binding or a physical binding doesn't really doesn't matter. He's bound and depowered and not able to do anything for a thousand years. The angel confines Satan to the bottomless pit in referring to him as the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan. As I was reading that, I, I read, the ancient serpent, who is the devil. And so I asked this question, what do you think is the meaning of the name the ancient serpent. Why was it specifically... We, we know who Satan is, right? So why did the angel specifically use the word the ancient serpent? Because of back at, at the time of Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Bingo. Yep. <laughs> yep. Because who was it that tempted Eve and, and tempted uh, uh, Adam? It was a serpent. Mm-hmm. 
serpent. A serpent with legs, by the way. Controlled by Satan. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. If not the very personification of Satan in a in a physical a physical form. Uh, I think probably that's not correct, though. Uh, I think probably because the 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 serpent, the snake, was punished by taking away its legs and having to crawl on its belly. So I think it probably was an animal. It wasn't. It wasn't Satan taking on the form. It was Satan indwelling an animal. Um, but either either case, you know, I think that's part of why. We have a visceral response to snakes, except people that are crazy and dead. I mean, it. it's only crazy people. But yet, too, says he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. Right. So, so here is clearly he's using the name serpent, the ancient serpent, for uh, Satan. My, my statement earlier was, I'm not sure if in the Garden of Eden, if, if Satan took on a physical form of a serpent or was possessing an already existing uh, snake. And I think the possession of the snake is probably more, more, is probably more right because God punished the snake. Thank goodness. Yeah. And I think that's why we all have, most of us have a visceral response to snakes. I think that's part of the way God programmed us. Mm -hmm. But if it was Satan indwelling him, why punish the snake? Well, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> I suppose it doesn't make any difference if, if he punished him, him uh, punished the snake for indwelling or just having Satan look like the snake. But, but like you say, a snake is a snake, so who cares? Right. That's the way I look at it. It's only crazy people that like snakes. <laughs> That's right. So, so in England today, a gentleman got on a double-decker bus wearing his face mask, but his face mask was actually a live snake wrapped around his neck. Oh, no. <laughs> and nobody oh, had it. no way. <laughs> See, that's just sick in the head. <laughs> That's what that is. That doesn't even that doesn't even make stupid sense. No. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, so Satan was put into the uh, into the, the the pit and the pit was shut and sealed. Uh -huh. Now look at verse look at verse three again. Threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him. Here's why. So that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. The word the nations is the Greek word ethne, from where we get ethnic, which is most often used in the Greek New Testament to speak of Gentile nations. So if we read it that way, threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the Gentiles any longer until the thousand years were ended. Now, why would that be? Why would, why would, why the specificity of not deceive the Gentiles? When does people walking around? Well, but there were there were, but what's the difference? Well, they were his chosen people, right? But we we dis, we discovered two weeks ago. Oh, here comes my sister. I, I'm guessing her clock is off. Mm -hmm. We we discussed a couple of weeks ago that those entering the millennium are all redeemed people. Remember I, I had that that bad study session in Matthew? They're all redeemed. But but what is the difference between Jews and Gentiles entering the millennium? They're they're all redeemed at that point. If I was going to make an argument 
in this instance. I would say the difference might be that the Jews have the new covenant, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and perhaps redeemed in the millennial kingdom, uh, redeemed Gentiles in the millennial kingdom do not. Now, I can't argue that very forcefully because we're not told that anywhere. And so I'm only looking, I'm looking for the difference of why um, Satan would be bound so that he might not deceive the ethne, the Gentiles, any longer. There, there's something different between them. So one thought is it might be that the new covenant, which is in effect for Israel during the millennial kingdom, um, if it makes a difference, it would have to be because then the Gentiles don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Or perhaps because David will be occupying the throne of Israel and ruling Israel, he protects Israel and there won't be anybody specifically protecting the Gentiles. That's not a great argument either. Uh, so I, I, I have not come to a conclusion of why Satan was bound so that he can't deceive the nations, the ethne, which most often is referred to the Gentiles. I, I can't, I, I, I don't know why he won't be allowed to, uh, or why specifically the Gentiles are mentioned. Why would there be a difference in the millennium of the redeemed people coming to know the Lord not having the Holy Spirit? Well, there is a difference between the church age and the Old Testament economy, the age of law. They didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we're not told that anybody other than Jews will have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And we're only told that by looking at Jeremiah 31, the New Covenant, that they will have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So it's possible that they won't. I don't know. Uh, I just know that that nobody had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit before the cross, before, before Pentecost, is a better way to say that. Um, and... I don't know about other dispensations. I just know previous dispensations didn't have it. And we're not told what happens afterwards. So, hi, Mary. Okay. Hi, sorry about that. Patches is very sick. Oh, that's not good. No, it's not. I've been scrubbing my house all day because <laughs> he's just leaving a trail through both ends. Whew, no good. No. So I apologize for being late. That's okay. So... Anybody have a theory that they want to posit there uh, of why uh, that he might not deceive the ethne or the Gentiles any longer? It's on my list to uh, study more, but at this point, I don't have a I don't have an answer. It's another one of those things that makes me go, "Ha!" Huh. And I don't like those things. That's two tonight. So if I'm irritable the rest of the week, you'll know why. Oh. I know, poor Linda, right? <laughs> could, it, could it be that uh, it kind of goes along with what we said earlier about why he's binding him for, so we can't say the devil made me do it, so this is kind of the same thing. The nations or the leaders or people can't say Satan deceived me. Yeah, they, they won't be able to say that. My, my question is why Gentiles specifically? Why, why, why did he, why, why did the angel, or why did John record so that he might not deceive the ethne? The, that's the Greek word, the nations any longer. Um, and almost always, maybe even always, ethne is a reference to the Gentile nations. So clearly, I think by hermeneutical principles, clearly there is a separation between Jews and Gentiles in what's being said here. Clearly, in the in the millennial kingdom, there is a separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews will. I, I had an old boss that used to say that guys of the same rank still had rank or rank order because they, you know, uh, first among equals. And I don't know if that's a good argument for how, how God will address Israel and the nations during the Millennial Kingdom. I don't think so. I think Israel will be different. They've always been called to be different. God's never let them off the hook from being different. And they will be different. 
And that's another reason why I think David will be on the throne ruling Israel as Jesus is on the throne ruling the world. Mary, you tried to say something several times. I think it's just the fact that they are the special people he has chosen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. They're the, they're the chosen people. The status that they do. Right. We do now. During this age, we do. Yes. Paul makes it very clear. There's no difference between Jew and Greek, Jew and Gentile. But then there will be. Then there will be, right. And that drives Americans crazy. <laughs> well, is there any prophecy uh, where things that uh, God has uh, promised the Jews that would be fulfilled during the millennium? Oh, yeah, there's lots of Old Testament prophecies. That's the problem when you go through the, the Old Testament, uh, particularly the minor prophets. They weave in and out of the millennial kingdom because they didn't see a time. They didn't see the church age. And so they didn't see a time when, when Israel would be set on the side. And, and they just saw this as future fulfillment for Israel. And so some of it is is in the millennial kingdom. Some of it is in the eternity. And some of it... Excuse me, is in, in the church age. So they're so that he's definitely treating them differently. Absolutely. During, during the millennium, so that wouldn't make a separation between Yeah, there, there's absolutely a difference between Israel and uh, and the, the ethne during the millennial kingdom. Which from our American sensibility is wrong. After all, we say we're all created equal. Well, no. That's not true in, in the Millennial Kingdom. There's Jews, and then there's Gentiles. Is that would have been a question about why you talk to Gentiles, specifically in that verse, about Israel. But Satan didn't just, didn't just uh, uh, deceive Gentiles. He deceived, he deceived Jews perhaps more than Gentiles. Maybe God's protecting them more. Well, that's what I, I... I think that might be the right answer, Steve, that he's protecting him more because of David on the throne. And I don't say that to disparage what Jesus does for, for the world writ large, but it's, it's, I don't have an answer. Mary, it's your turn. I was just going to say, I wonder if it isn't just simply because they're their promises are being fulfilled. In the church age, the focus has been on Gentile believers, basically, because that's basically who makes up the church age. But in the in the millennium, the focus is on the Jews because they are... That's what the millennium is for. It's for them. Yeah, it's, well, it's, no, it's it's for the whole world. But it is, it is primarily for them. They get all the blessings they've been promised. Um, but there will, still be, there will still be pretty good things going on for Gentiles. <coughs> True, but if the Jews weren't going to get their, their promises fulfilled, there would be no need for the, for the millennium. So, to me, it makes sense that God's going to provide protection for the Jews because he's protecting that which he promised for them this whole time. He didn't promise anything for the Gentile believers for that time period. That's correct. There's definitely a difference. There's a, there's a different standard and there's a different relationship. Now, uh, I want to, I want to get on to, uh, to one subject tonight and and we won't go any further after that um we've had discussions in the past whether demons will be bound with satan because specifically here in these verses it is satan that is bound and so we've we've batted this question around sometimes ad nauseum and it doesn't seem like we're given much information in scripture about uh the demons i have argued that the demons would have to be bound in order for it to be a true exercise of pure um, human sinful nature uh, because demons can influence a lot of uh, stuff. So I've looked at this passage as well as other related text to see if I could come up with a hint somewhere. And I've, I've spent a lot of time over the last few years looking at this. 
So in Isaiah chapter 24, I finally found a text that can, can give us a hint. Isaiah 24, 21 and 22. On that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in a prison. And after many days, they will be punished. So Isaiah is telling us that God will ultimately punish those who work at, keep, uh, at keeping people away from him or directing people away. Host of heaven is a very frequent Old Testament phrase for angels. Sometimes good angels, sometimes bad angels. It's a common Old Testament description for the angelic world. Isaiah says they'll be bound together in a pit, a prison, for a period of time. And then they will be punished. In other words, the binding in the pit is not the punishment. The thousand year sequester of Satan is not his punishment. The lake of fire is. So if, if I put this verse together with what we just read in the beginning of uh, Revelation 21, I conclude that Isaiah has given us a hint that when Satan is bound in the abyss, that his demons will be bound with him, If that's not what he's doing, I don't know what Isaiah is telling us. Well, I agree with you because I think that if they weren't bound with him, that he could still tell them what to do and they could still wreak havoc in his name. Yeah. He would have to be bound with him, right? I, I, that, that would be an argument that could be made, yes. I agree with that. And that's been part of the perplexing problem. Since we, are, since we don't have a specific verse that tells us that they're bound... We, we, my, my principle has always been we go with what, what Scripture tells us and the rest we can't say dogmatically. Well, I'm on a much heavier dogmatic scale on the demons being bound than I was before I came across this passage in Isaiah. Anybody want to argue it a different way? No. Good. <laughs> I'm not having looked at that verse. What's the relation of the kings? Well, kings, kings is often used. Uh, kings and princes. Um, angels are often called princes. Um, and so I, there's, there's two ways that I would interpret that. It could be human leaders that have uh, drawn people away from God. Which certainly is in keeping with the picture of, of uh, the great Babylon, uh, the harlot Babylon in uh, 18 and 19. But, but that would be saying that those kings, those human kings, will be bound for the thousand years. Right, and on that day the Lord will punish the host of heaven, in, in heaven, and the kings of the earth on the earth. So, if, if we interpret kings as being humans the leadership, national leadership, we have two things in view. We have the host in heaven, and we have the kings or the national leadership. If you view kings, on, uh, kings of the earth as being, as being a reference to, as angels sometimes are, the princes on the earth, then, uh, then both would be talking about the demons. But at this point, um, I would argue that that either is a suitable answer given what we know but certainly the host of heaven is the angelic world yeah i wouldn't doubt that so you have one or two different people in view there go ahead whoever said that uh, it was me uh i was reading my notes on one through uh three mm -hmm. and it referenced back to luke 31 yeah. Where, where he's messing with the, the legion of uh, with the swine. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And they begged him that he would not command them to go into the abyss. Right. The, the abyss is a place for demons other than just Satan. That's correct. Um, the angels that, or not the angels, the demons that were occupying those snakes, 
pigs. Swine. I got I got snakes on the on the brain. Those swine, those pigs, begged to not be sent to the to the abyss. So they had the the knowledge of the abyss already. Um, many many believe that their knowledge of the abyss comes from Genesis chapter six, where the the sons of God and the daughters of men, angels and human women cohabitate, making the Nephilim. Jude tells us that they were bound since that time in the abyss. And so word spread in the angel community. They put it out on Facebook and on Twitter. God will send you to the abyss if you do something really, really bad. And so they knew that. And, and, and as I put all of this together, I conclude demons are bound during the thousand years. And I would challenge anybody to to prove it the other way. Because I, I, I will grant to you that I'm on, you know, two inch ice. I'm not on thin, thin ice, but it's not it's not thick ice. I'm not driving my car on it. <laughs> but I don't mind walking on it. How's that for an analogy? MacArthur also says in his note that the climactic phase of the day of the Lord, he will strike against the rebelling forces, both angelic and human. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to know that Dr. MacArthur agrees with me sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Here comes your halo back. <laughs> <laughs> He's got to be like Paul. His next book's going to be written for prison. <laughs> Yep. Well, that might happen. <laughs> I can be. Um, any, any other questions or comments? We'll pick up in uh, Revelation uh, 20, verse 4 next week. Yeah, that's a little moment. Yes? Back on so that he would not deceive the nations any longer. Could this not just be referring to the fact that in the millennium he is bound and so therefore he won't be be the producing of the actual yeah absolutely that's what it said that's what it's saying the the question is why specifically ethne when when you read the verse that he will not deceive the nations any longer why the okay. specific word ethne there okay that's the question so you're saying that maybe the jews cannot be deceived like the Gentiles can be deceived? I, I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying is John uses a word here, ethne, that leaves open the interpretation of what this means. Why specifically did John say so that he might not deceive the nations, the Gentiles, any longer? Because he deceived everybody. Yeah. So why did he say it that way? Those kinds of things drive me crazy. Perhaps if I hadn't been a detective for a long time and a and a, uh, uh, a financial crimes detective where I had to look at every jot and tittle so often, it wouldn't drive me crazy. But those things just drive me nuts. There's a reason that that word was used. You know, he could have said the world. Mm -hmm. Or he could have said everybody. But he said ethne. And almost every time, if not every time, that word is used, it refers to the Gentiles. So why just the Gentiles? Those things drive me cuckoo. I know it's a short trip, but it's it's, the, it's a cross reference. I want that section of the verse. Nobody touches it. Nobody nobody's bothered by this but me. <laughs> That's it. There's not even a cross reference. I know. I spent a lot of time trying to figure this out cuz I don't like not having answers. But there isn't there isn't an answer that I can derive from this. And so I just go to bed going bleh, 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 bleh. And Linda doesn't get any sleep. <laughs> so, any other questions? Or Thank comments? you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. 
Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.